Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and thank you for joining us. The Naval War College Foundation's eighth Newport Lecture Series presentation of the 2020 to 2021 academic year, Disruptive Technologies and International Law. I am George Lang, CEO of the Naval War College Foundation, and it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening. I also want to thank Chairman Bilden, our esteemed Board of Trustees, members, friends, and benefactors, as well as my staff for their continued support and commitment for the rewarding missions of the Naval War College and the Naval War College Foundation. Enabled by our generous foundation members for more than half a century, the college is able to continue its innovative, cutting edge research, teaching and wargaming programs that sustain it as America's premier institution and standard bearer for professional military education. Thank you. Tonight's presentation is an example of the scholarly topics, mid-grade and senior level officers of our joint force team are immersed in during their 10 month rigorous academic experience at the Naval War College. I know you will enjoy it. Before I continue, just a reminder that should a question come to you during the presentation, please submit it via the, the Q&A box and I'll be happy to present it to our guest speaker during the Q&A session. As I like to say at the beginning of these presentations, this is an event that is typically hosted monthly during the academic year at the Naval Station Newport Officers Club, usually preceded by a 30 minute reception where guests can mingle with Naval War College Foundation staff and friends, and typically the guest speaker of the evening. However, since COVID appeared on the horizon early last year, we've been bringing Newport Lecture Series presentations and many others hosted by the foundation to you virtually. A significant benefit of this approach is the opportunity to interact with many of our members and friends across the nation, not just in the local area. So we appreciate you tuning in from afar. And please know, we are eager, as I'm sure all of you are, to return to in-person events just as soon as it's safe to do so for our many members and guests. Now to introduce and welcome your distinguished guest speaker this evening. Dr. James Kraska has been with the Naval War College since 2008, first in uniform and then in a civilian suit, and currently serves as the Charles H. Stockton Professor of International Maritime Law in the Stockton Center for International Law at the U.S. Naval War College, where he's a tenured full professor. He also serves as visiting professor of law and John Harvey Gregory lecturer on world organization at Harvard Law School, where he teaches international law of the sea. Previously, he was a visiting professor at the University of the Philippines College of Law and Kujarat National Law University and a visiting scholar at Duke University and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He is a permanent member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Dr. Kraska earned a BA from Mississippi State University Honors Program, a Master of Arts in Interdisciplinary Studies from the School of Politics and Economics Claremont uh, Graduate School, a Juris Doctor degree from Indiana University Maurer School of Law, and a Master's in Law and Doctor of Judicial Science degrees from the University of Virginia School of Law. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. James Kraska. Captain Lang, thank you very much for that warm introduction, and thank you to the Naval War College Foundation and to your staff. Uh, I, what I'm going to talk about this evening is uh, disruptive technology and the law of the sea. Excuse me, disruptive technologies and international law. Law of the sea is my area, but uh, I'm going to give you a broader overview of all of the things that the Stockton Center for International Law is doing with disruptive technologies. Thank you also to your broader Naval War College Foundation uh, participants and uh, supporters for all of the work that you've done to enable the research and the programs that we do at the Naval War College. International law at the Naval War College has a long legacy. In fact, it goes back to general order number one which focused on teaching two subjects at the Naval War College back in the late 19th century. The first was strategy, and the second was international law. And we've been teaching international law ever since. The first publication of the Naval War College was actually International Law Studies, the journal of the Stockton Center for International Law. It also happens to be the oldest journal of international law in the United States, and it's a top 10 rated international law journal in the world. And 
now we have the Stockton Center for International Law, and we have military professors from all five of the U.S. Armed Forces, as well as currently the Royal Air Force of the United Kingdom, and we host visiting scholars from ministries of defense and judge advocates from around the world. We focus on two areas, and the first is that we attempt to lead turn areas that are emerging, and we'll talk about some of those issues this evening. And then the second is that we sometimes revisit areas that are that are misunderstood and to correct the record or to shape the law. We're the only U.S. academic institution that focuses on all domain military operations and international law. And much of international law is developed in Europe, and Europe has its, its own unique uh, view. An example is in the law of armed conflict. So while in the United States and much of the world, we focus on the law of armed conflict, which is a balance between military necessity and the commander's intent and humanitarian considerations, in Europe and some other countries, they even have a different term for it. They call it international humanitarian law, and it imposes constraints that are not accepted by all states. So we play within that space, and there's no more area as fertile in shaping international law today with regard to military operations than disruptive technologies. So we're focusing almost all of our effort now on disruptive technologies that are changing the operational military environment. So we'll talk about artificial intelligence, autonomous ships and aircraft, directed energy weapons, uh, hypersonic weapons, and how we can use some of these uh, and what are the laws that apply and what are some of the legal issues that pertain. International law that governs military operations, or in my specialty, uh, maritime operations and naval operations, uh, are a combination of treaties and customary international law. And emerging and new, uh, new weapons or new techniques that are being developed have to undergo a weapons review for their compliance with international law. You'll notice on some of these uh, displayed here that both the treaties and customary international law that apply to military operations are relatively older sources. Uh, for example, the first manual on the law of naval warfare was developed at the Naval War College. It was published in 1900 by Rear Admiral Stockton a former uh, president of the Naval, Naval War College and the namesake for the chair that I uh, am fortunate enough to occupy. So we have to grapple with applying these, these older authorities to these emerging technologies. The Stockton Center is also the review authority for the Navy for the Commander's Handbook on the Law of Naval Operations, which is a tri-service Sea service publication that's uh, produced, uh, that's printed by the Naval Warfare Development Command as Navy, Coast Guard, and Marine Corps doctrine. And we focus on the interpretation and application of these legacy authorities in international law to support operational commanders, to give them maximum flexibility, and to influence and shape the progressive development of the law. So this is our contribution for legal preparation for the battle space. So let's dig into some of these issues and look forward to discussing them and also maybe taking uh, some questions. So we have a civilian, Professor Pedrozo, and also I that focus a lot on maritime issues. And in peacetime, these are governed by the law of the sea and the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which applies to ships or vessels that are entitled to navigational freedom, 
that is essential for the United States to connect with our friends and allies in Asia and in Europe. And they include the right of innocent passage in the territorial sea, as well as high seas freedoms in the exclusive economic zone or the right of transit passage through international straits. Each one of these navigational regimes or set of rules has uh, particular nuances. So for example, in innocent passage, passage is innocent so long as it's not prejudicial to the peace, the good order, or the security of the coastal state. Traditionally, that meant that uh, vessels, including warships, could not launch and recover devices or, or uh, uh, military, um, uh, military aircraft in innocent passage. One of the questions that we focused on is, are unmanned maritime systems, are they considered ships within the meaning of the law of the sea convention and therefore also entitled to these same rights as, uh, as manned surface ships are. The flip side of that is that our, if unmanned or autonomous vessels are considered to be ships within the law of the sea, then do they assume the same responsibilities of their manned counterparts, such as under the Safety of Life at Sea Convention? And we believe that they actually, the, the answer to both of those questions is in the affirmative, that these unmanned systems do have those same navigational rights, and they also have the same responsibilities of the flag state, in particular under Article 94 of the Law of the Sea Convention to comply with uh, the rules of the road, the collision regulations, uh, traffic separation schemes, and the rest. There's even more implication with regard to the law of the sea and, and autonomous or unmanned warships. Warships are a special subset of ships. And so even if our unmanned or autonomous vessels are considered ships, we want them also to be considered warships because there are particular benefits that flow from that status. Well, what's a warship? A warship is a ship that meets a four-part test. It has to belong to the armed forces of a state, has to bear the external markings, uh, distinguishing its nationality. And then the last two elements of this checklist are key. It has to be under the command of an officer duly commissioned by the state. And then furthermore, has to be manned by a crew which is under regular armed forces discipline. So you can see that meeting those last two elements is somewhat problematic with unmanned warships. How can they be under the command of an officer or manned by a crew? If fully autonomous, can a, a autonomous vessel ever meet this test? We have suggested that it has because they can do they can meet that test through uh, some sort of extended relationship to a commanding officer and a virtual crew. There's another important uh, aspect to this, which is if a vessel is considered a warship under this definition I've just talked about that's in the Law of the Sea Convention, then it is entitled to two specific benefits, which are critically important for the Navy and the Department of Defense. The first is that it enjoys sovereign immunity. It's immune from foreign jurisdiction. The second, and this is key, is that it enjoys belligerent rights. In the Law of Naval Warfare, only warships are entitled to belligerent rights. This means that those vessels can conduct strike operations, engage in combat, as well as do some more mundane tasks, which are enjoyed only by belligerents, 
such as the right of visit and search of neutral commercial vessels to determine whether they're carrying contraband. This analysis also flows to submarines, which uh, are entitled to innocent passage in the territorial sea so long as they travel on the surface of the water. In this case, you may not want a submarine to, to actually be considered a, uh, a vessel. If it's something smaller, like a device, then it's not clear whether this requirement to travel on the surface actually pertains. The same type of navigational issues and sovereign immune rights also apply to unmanned aircraft. And in this regard, the Department of Defense has already determined through policy and regulation that unmanned aircraft are, they do constitute aircraft and they have all of the same rights and responsibilities as civilian aircraft. We are in the process of revising and uh, coordinating the revision of the commander's handbook on the law of naval operations to ensure that that status uh, is carried over to, uh, to vessels and, and to warships as well. One of the technologies that everybody is probably familiar with our predator drones. Now these are remote piloted, so they're not unmanned for the moment. And the issues that come into play here are that states have an inherent right of self-defense against armed attack. And over the past 15 years or so, we were all become familiar with reading about how the United States has employed drones and drone strikes in Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Yemen, uh, and elsewhere. If response is to an armed attack, then uh, if, if the response is to an armed attack in self-defense, then that constitutes an armed conflict. And, and what that means is that there's a law that applies in time of peace, and that's regular law enforcement, and there's a, there's a law that applies during armed conflict, and that's the law of war. And the law of war allows status-based targeting. That's the law that allows us to target uh, people, say Taliban or ISIS, with drones without any sort of due process. They can be targeted simply because they are a member of an organized armed group that poses a threat to the United States. That brings up some interesting issues. For example, if we're involved in an armed conflict, then collateral damage applies. There's a proportionality test. And yet, we've never really said that we're actually at war in some of these circumstances. And so there's a bit of a disconnect. This is why these drones tend to follow their targets around maybe for several days to ensure that they can do a clean strike that minimizes or even eliminates collateral damage uh, because we're kind of in this legal gray zone. If it were purely peacetime and you had say an American citizen who was uh, a member of one of these organized armed groups, then presumably they might be entitled to some sort of due process before the state actually just went ahead and killed them. On the other hand, if they are on a battlefield during an armed conflict, whether they're American or some other national, national and they've taken up arms against the United States, then they're not entitled to that due process. Let's look at on the spectrum of autonomy or autonomous weapons or thinking machines. Uh, those of us that have been in the Navy, including uh, Captain Lang, are quite familiar with the phalanx, the, the CWIS, the close-in weapon system. This is a rapid fire computer controlled radar directed gun, which, is, which provides defense against small boats and aircraft and anti-ship cruise missiles inbound to 
uh, our vessels. It's also used in a land variant as a counter rocket and counter uh, mortar capability. This fires 4,500 rounds a minute, 75 rounds a second. And in fully autonomous mode, it can identify, track, select uh, its targets. The en entire kill chain is automa automated. Humans cannot think fast enough, let alone act quickly enough to destroy these inbound targets. So we've been using this for about 30 years. And of course, we're looking at the follow on to this. We're approaching greater or even full autonomy with artificial intelligence, lethal autonomous weapon systems with AI. And what does that mean for the law of armed conflict? In particular, how do we think about the so-called black box of the computer? How the algorithm goes from the programming that we put into it that's executing the human vision. And as that algorithm, if it's a machine learning or true AI capability, as it begins to learn and it changes the algorithm, suppose we have an algorithm that says A, B, and C uh, equal a red circle, and that's your target. And then we program that into the algorithm or the black box. But suddenly over time, uh, suddenly and over time, as the AI begins to learn on its own, it might decide that A, B, and C form this red circle, but also Toronto. And we have no idea how it got to Toronto. Now, sometimes we can go back and, and retroactively and trace the path through the algorithm and see what the computer was thinking, but not all the time and the critics are worried then. Our conclusion is that, and we have a, a Marine Corps judge advocate that's an expert in this who attends meetings in Geneva uh, with the, the, the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons that's looking at this regulation. Our conclusion is that this is not a legal problem. Even if we don't know exactly how the black box got to the conclusion, or even if it's adding in factors we hadn't anticipated, or we don't even know what those factors are, that's okay. Critics, though, are deeply worried about this, including the, the NGO community. Our view is that, that that may raise some ethical or moral issues about this algorithm determining, determining who to kill and not to kill. But it's not a issue, it's a red herring from a legal standpoint, because all we care about is whether the machine uh, hits the right target, can the machine uh, strike the right target and therefore comply with the law of war? And then can the commander or the operator employ these systems and be in compliance? Right now, the debate is over the commander or operator's ability to provide super, uh, supervision or oversight to control the weapon system. But if you think back to the CWIS, a ship captain, you might say that they control that system, but they really don't. Once it's on fully autonomous mode, it can hit anything that's, that's coming in. And indeed, we want it to. We need it to because we can't act more quickly. Our view is, and I, I, I've written an article on this, is that nonetheless, the commander has responsibility for all of the the methods and means of warfare that he or she employs in the battle space. And therefore, the commander is accountable or responsible for whatever goes on, even if the machine makes a determination that's unexpected. Our, our concern is that the machine complies with the law of war and that the commander maintains overall accountability. Moving on to directed weapons. So we use lasers as range finders, as target, target designators, and we're starting to think about them uh, as a kinetic capability, as a weapon. There's very little regulation on this right now. There is 
for the CCW convention I just mentioned, the convention on certain conventional weapons. There is protocol four of that treaty that focuses on blinding lasers. And what it says is that it bans lasers that are specifically designed as their sole combat function to cause permanent blindness. So it doesn't regulate any other type of directed energy device. And so that already has been taken off the table, which is a, uh, an issue of unnecessary suffering or superfluous injury to develop a device that is purposefully designed to blind somebody. It's a precautionary obligation with respect to laser systems. Hypersonic missiles are now at the cusp of entering into the U.S. inventory and already are uh, with Russia and China, which appear actually to be in the lead in this capability. These are weapons that go between Mach 5 to 15, 5 to 15 times the speed of sound. So ballistic missiles are easy to track because they follow a predictable arc from launch to target, and we have anti-ballistic missile capabilities. Some of these hypersonic missiles ride a ballistic missile, missile bus up into space, and then they, they glide along their own shockwave at a relatively low altitude. And right now, they're too fast to be shot down, at least by current capabilities, such as our theater high-altitude air defense missiles. The Russian Kinzhal missile, for example, has a range of 1,200 miles, and it can go at a speed of Mach 10, 7,500 miles an hour. Uh, China is developing anti-ship ballistic missiles that go at the same speed. Uh, too low to be tracked, too fast to be hit. So these are posing a real, a, a real challenge. What does international law have to say? Well, there is a law of air warfare and missiles are part of it. And these are just more of the same. They're just more advanced variants of the same types of missiles. The biggest legal issue here is that in the law of armed conflict, in the conduct of military operations, commanders have to take constant care to spare the civilian populations, civilians and civilian objects. And that is harder with hypersonic missiles because of a rule or a principle called precautions in attack. The commanders have to take all feasible precautions to avoid and to minimize incidental loss of civilian life. And with hypersonic missiles, what you have is a compressed time frame, both on the receiving end, if you believe that you're being attacked by hypersonic missiles, particularly, let's say, for, uh, for nuclear strategy and for nuclear deterrence, you have much less time to react. And then also in using them offensively, all the time frames are compressed, and so the, mar the, the likelihood of error grows. And so there, there seems to be a, a, a sort of additional emphasis on, on understanding the precautions that you're taking in order to avoid superfluous injury to, uh, to civilians. Let's move on to outer space law. The current space law regime uh, regulates military and civilian activities in outer space, principally through five treaties. But the treaties are relatively vague and open-ended, and all of them are a product of about 50 years ago. So now we're entering into a new space age where we have micro satellites and the potential for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of satellites. Outer space under the Outer Space Treaty is reserved for peaceful purposes. And so we have the issue of dual use satellites and satellites such as GPS. Are those for peaceful purposes? 
we have an analogy to that question in the law of the sea. The law of the sea says that the oceans are reserved for peaceful purposes, and therefore you may operate warships so long as they comply with the Charter of the United Nations. And so we would think that the same type of analysis applies in outer space. But we don't know now with the proliferation of satellites, whether there will be new developments in these legacy treaties. And even whether the United States should push for better law, or should we be glad about the ambiguity and the freedom that exists in the legacy treaties. We're also not sure whether the norms that develop will be will come from the bottom up so that corporations such as Elon Musk or Amazon, are they creating new rules of the road that the Pentagon will then have to uh, address? Our Royal Air Force officer, uh, Tieran Tinkler, who just made wing commander below zone, a, a real superstar, he's looking at these as part of an international group working on a manual for warfare for outer space, similar to the commander's handbook. Just like in the law of cyber operations, the issues involve whether functional denial of a satellite, say a GPS satellite, is, is functional denial tantamount to a use of force in outer space. For example, if we're jamming a Chinese satellite, either from Earth or, or orbital, if we're interfering with that uplink or downlink, when is that denial, uh, when does that cross the line with jamming of this electromagnetic connection between the Earth and a missile early warning satellite? Does that ever amount to an unlawful use uh, as an imminent armed attack? Is that something that constitutes the use of force? Even more generally, does the law of armed conflict apply in outer space, given that there's no state practice? If there are no rules of the law of armed conflict, then what methodology, methodology should we be using now to start to develop those rules? Also, uh, what about other things such as uh, the potential for catastrophic effect of multiple debris, large debris fields caused by anti-satellite uh, events, debris generating events in space? Um, how do we accommodate those? So all of these things are unknown at the moment and we're on the cutting edge of developing these. We've done a lot with cyber operations over the past uh, 20 years, as a matter of fact. We have Professor Emeritus Mike Schmidt, who's affiliated with the center as a non-resident uh, fellow. And we have an Air Force Judge Advocate, uh, Colonel Jeremy Davis, looking at peacetime hacking and also armed conflict and what it means in cyberspace. It was the, the, the issues of cyber and international law really emerged from the, the old International Law Department at the Naval War College some 20 years ago when it was called computer network attack or computer network uh, defense. And uh, the terms information warfare were being, uh, were being studied. So sovereignty is a core principle of international law and there's a debate on on sovereignty and hacking into another country's computer systems. And is sovereignty regarded as a standalone rule of international law so that hacking into a com computer system in another country, does that violate this rule of international law? And that's sort of the majority opinion, but there's a minority opinion that sovereignty is not really of itself a rule and that it's not a violation of international law when you disregard the sovereignty of a state, unless that interference or that hacking, uh, penetrating the sovereignty uh, has some sort of coercive element or coercive 
interference in the state. With regard to armed conflict and cyber issues, there's also considerations about the threshold for what constitutes an armed attack in the cyber world. So the Charter of the United Nations prohibits states from using or threatening to use armed aggression under Article 2, Paragraph 4. Article 51 allows or recognize, recognizes the inherent right of states to act in self-defense against an armed attack. So it's very important to know when an armed attack takes place, and it's not exactly clear sometimes in cyberspace. So cyber operations may constitute an armed attack, uh, and if so, then that triggers the right of self-defense. The use of force doesn't always have to mean sending in uh, military. Uh, even the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, has recognized that arming and training insurgent groups, such as the U.S. did in Nicaragua with the Contras during the Reagan administration, that could constitute an armed attack. So maybe just providing malware or training on cyber attacks, that might also constitute the use of force. But in, in the International Court of Justice, not every use of force constitutes an armed attack for the purposes of self-defense. So we have generally adopted a functionality test. That is, if the scale and effects of these operations are tantamount to some sort of kinetic attack, people have been injured or killed, or there's some sort of substantial damage to property, then that might, uh, that crosses the line for an armed attack and would trigger the right of self-defense. But different states have different views on this. And of course, where you draw that line could be very different uh, depending on the person. Back in the naval realm, I had mentioned earlier about this belligerent right of visit and search. So in the law of naval warfare, warships are entitled, they have a right to go on board neutral ships anywhere in the world outside of the neutral territorial seas and board neutral commercial vessels to determine the enemy character of the ship or its cargo to ensure, for example, that it's not bringing uh, contraband, military material, ammunition, war material to the enemy. And so neutral ships have a duty to submit to this visit and search, and if they don't, they can actually be attacked. The purpose of visit and search is to inspect the ship and its papers. Now, of course, with a modern container ship, it's virtually, it is physically impossible when you have thousands of containers on board, you really cannot, it would take days actually to lift all these containers off and do an inspection. But you could inspect the paperwork and paperwork is replete throughout the maritime industry. Some estimates are that there's so many of these uh, uh, requirements for certificates and paper, it's about 30% of the cost of shipping. Naval control and protection of shipping focuses on what to do with this so-called white shipping, these merchant ships that are part of the oceanic battle space. It's possible that we could save a lot of time by using blockchain, not only in commercial shipping, which would reduce commercial shipping costs, but would it would help on the maritime side on the peacetime uh, efforts with the Coast Guard and Homeland Security to better understand what's on board those vessels. And then that also has similar applications during armed conflict and to obviate the need for a physical visit and board of a ship to, to uh, determine its enemy character 
or the, the nature of the cargo. Cyber operations at sea focus on what is allowed. So we have a, uh, a Coast Guard commander, uh, PETA, who's looking at cyber hacking, things like the 2017 uh, not PETIA attacks that devastated Maersk shipping, froze international shipping, and how do we grapple with cyber attacks that, uh, that target the automatic identification system, the satellite-based long-range identification and tracking of vessels. Both of these are part of the International Maritime Organization effort to track commercial vessels. Uh, there's vessel management services, and of course, um, GPS, they're useful in uh, tracking ships as well. And how do we think about uh, spoofing or interference with these electronic tracking systems in the peacetime era. We have a, a Navy JAG Lieutenant Commander that's focused on uh, what a ship can do when it is, what type of cyber emissions or cyber activities is a ship entitled to when it is at sea. For example, can a ship in Innocent Passage conduct cyber operations either against the coastal state or some other third state? And where do you draw that line between innocent passage or not innocent passage? Also, finally, on cyber, all of these rules apply to submarine cables because about 97% of inter internet traffic goes by submarine cables. And those are lying on the continental shelf. And coastal states have sovereign rights and jurisdiction to regulate what's going on on the continental shelf. In fact, all of our military capabilities are heading underwater because the surface is just so dangerous that platforms and capabilities are trying to hide in the water column or on the seabed, as you see here. Starpod, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, is developing a defense technology using special pods that hibernate on the ocean floor until they are deployed. Called upward falling payloads or UFPs, the pods are 15 feet high and can contain drones or weapon systems. The pods would be pre positioned throughout the world's oceans, lying dormant until they are activated in weeks, months, or years. Once released remotely, the UFP riser rapidly floats to the surface with the help of a buoyant collar. It then deploys on the surface, releasing whatever drone or weapon is contained inside. So this is not our first capability for the seabed. The military has operated the sound of the underwater sound surveillance system uh, ever since uh, the 1950s. And the questions are whether, the, whether we can do these sorts of activities on the continental shelf of other countries or whether other countries can uh, have similar capabilities on the US continental shelf. Our view is that these are part of high seas freedoms and that the coastal state jurisdiction over the continental shelf only applies to the living and non-living resources, such as oil and gas. Finally, the last thing that I'll mention is uh, biological warfare. We have two US Army officers, and one of them is uh, Colonel Johnson, who's looking at issues of Bio warfare and the Biological Weapons Convention. One of the issues is with regard to synthetic biology, uh, re engineered uh, using non biological materials to make synthetic biology. It's called biomimetics. And he's written that this may be a gap in the Biological Warfare Convention. Another issue is all too familiar with us, which is. Uh, these pandemics in, in peacetime and also potentially in armed conflict. And how do we think about gain of function research? This is biological research aimed at increasing the virulence or the lethality of passage, pathogens. And so gain of function research is uh, 
enhancing the lethality, lethality of these pathogens. And it's allowed under the Biological Warfare Convention for defensive purposes, but not for offensive purposes. Of course, the Wuhan laboratory uh, was engaged in gain of function technology. And so there's disagreements on whether the, the COVID-19 came from that laboratory or not. And of course, the World Health Organization has looked into it. The United States and Australia, Japan uh, and United Kingdom have pushed back and said that there's not been enough research on the nature of COVID. If a state has some sort of negligence, in peacetime with regard to some type of biological agent, then that raises the prospect of state responsibility under the law of state responsibility in international law and something that I've written about and also Colonel Johnson has written about, which is that the victim states then would be entitled to lawful countermeasures against the offending state in, in some circumstances. And countermeasures, meaning legal countermeasures, a suspension of ordinary legal obligations, not countermeasures in terms of some type of uh, attack against the, uh, the state that has um, violated their, their duties in international law. And so with that, uh, I'm finished and I would love to have a greater conversation and take any thoughts or questions anybody has. Well, thank you, Dr. Kraska. Uh, intriguing presentation. Um, I, I, I think I just have one quick question before I open up the floor to uh, to our guests. And of course, we have about about just about fifteen minutes or so for for Q and A. But and, and you might have referred to it as as lead turning, I guess. And in, in my mind, I'm thinking about some of the uh, some some of the weapon systems now that are. You know, to us are relatively new, and and maybe they're covered under you know the law of armed, armed conflict or the the charter of the United Nations, but but maybe not. But I wonder at what point do the lawyers get involved with some of these weapons as they're being envisioned? Because in most part, some of this stuff is being designed, and 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 I would argue that some don't even understand what the capability might be. So. Is it is it just a catch up, or are you involved even you know much early on in the research and development phase on what the appropriate laws might be you know regarding that weapon system? Yeah, so they in my former life I was a Navy judge advocate and and uh, there are Navy JAGs that that have uh, TSSCI clearance and are read into special programs uh, along the way. Uh, our work tends to be unclassified. We do have various clearances in the department where we support other elements of the war college, such as the war gaming department and the rest. Uh, but most of our, our academic work uh, is, of course, all of our academic work is unclassified. Um, and so in, in the in the development phase in the Pentagon, there are judge advocates that are engaged in the process, though. Thank you. Interesting. Well, thank you. So uh, a question uh, from Victor Sussman. If a warship must meet the criteria of being under the command of a duly commissioned officer and yet operates autonomously, how does accountability flow when an autonomous ship erroneously acts without direct orders or more critically fails to stop acting when commanded to do so? Yeah, so there's a lot of debate about this, and uh, particularly in the question of autonomous systems, whether we should have or what what should be the, the level of human control, me meaningful level of human control. And uh, our view is that the commander is responsible. Com commander has broad uh, accountability for whatever goes on under their charge. So you, if you have an artillery round, and through no fault of the commander, it lands 500 meters short and destroys a village, the commander is still accountable for that. It's just part of command responsibility. Thank you. Uh, from Bob Hallahan, in cyber warfare, attribution, um, sorry, my screen just jumped on me here. Let me move this up a little bit, I apologize. 
In cyber warfare, attribution has been a major problem. Has there been any progress in the last 10 years in agreements for determining attribution for a cyber attack? There's not been any, there's not been any agreement on uh, internationally, but the one big thing that has been developed uh, emerged from the Naval War College. This is the Tallinn Manual, which is accepted by most governments as a restatement of the law that applies to cyber operations. And Professor Schmidt that I mentioned is the editor, the organizer of this, of this uh, effort. So the War College has been at the center of developing the rules on, uh, on attribution, but there's not any consensus. Uh, this uh, manual though contains different perspectives on where you can attribute. And that's, that's a, an excellent question because if you think back, for example, to the oil platforms case between the US and Iran, the International Court of Justice was unwilling to attribute attacks against oil tankers in the Gulf to Iran, even though the United States had uh, substantial evidence that Iran was um, conducting missile strikes against US and other uh, flag merchant ships. And even more so, if you recall in that time, the United States intercepted a ship called the Iran Ajar that had mines on board the ship. And we actually caught them laying mines in the water, this Iranian vessel. A mine that had a sequential number as the mines on board the Iran Ajar struck the Samuel B. Roberts, put a huge hole in it, of course, um, caused damage and, and death and injury. Even though the mines sequentially numbered that, that hit the Samuel Roberts, uh, was consistent with the mines on the Iran Ajar. The International Court of Justice was unwilling to attribute that attack to Iran, which I think uh, was a was a, a poor decision, an incorrect decision uh, as a matter of law. So reasonable people can disagree on attribution, and what that leaves us with is that we are in a state system of sovereign states, and sovereign states are entitled to self-defense, and they can take self-help measures as they deem appropriate. Thank you. And, and as, a, as a follow up from Bob Hallahan as well, is it also what is the likelihood that the Biden administration will persuade the Senate to ratify UNCLOSE? Oh. Thank you. That's a, a good question. So the US interagency community has supported uh, UNCLOSE, uh, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Since 1994, that's when part 11 on seabed mining was revised to address the concerns of the Reagan administration. And so President Clinton signed the convention, but Senator Jesse Helms, who was chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, didn't like the UN all that much. And so he never brought it to a vote on the floor. Uh, Senator Luger, uh, they voted 21 to 0 when he was chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, subsequently, Senator Biden was chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. But by that time, it never got a vote, a final vote on the floor. Uh, Bill Frist blocked it when he was Senate Majority Leader. Uh, the last attempt was in 2012, and that was the, the time that 34 Republican senators signed a letter saying that they would not agree, they would not join or ratify the Law of the Sea Convention. Of those uh, 34 Republicans, 21 are now still in office. They're, they're still senators. Uh, so there's 21 that are likely no votes. Um, and that gets to your question of the Biden administration. And I think that it's, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic. I think that it's in the U.S. interest to sign the convention or to ratify the convention. And uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, but remember, uh, for example, President Obama, uh, even when, the, when he had a majority in the Senate, was not able to do so. And the reason was not that the president disagreed with the convention. Uh, every U.S. government department and agency has endorsed it. It's just that it takes floor time 
in the Senate and presidents have other pressing priorities. And so with, with President Obama, it was the world economy in 2008 fell off a cliff. Um, President Biden's you know, got plenty to do now with the world is not exactly um, you know, stable and, and our economy and that sort of thing. So uh, it, I don't think it would happen quickly, but uh, it could happen in, in the next few years. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a better crystal ball than that. <laughs> Very good. Um, from David Varlin, a great brief. Thanks much. Uh, with respect to the cyber domain, when our adversaries, when our adversaries understand or clear legal red lines, and they operate just underneath the levels that might violate those laws, i.e., no death but expensive remediation action, what options do you see the nation retaining for countering these these get these uh, zone tactics? These get zone tactics. My view is it's it's very much like um, like for example, freedom of navigation, the law and the policy is already in place. And so uh, whether the United States continues to, uh, to exercise freedom of navigation in the South China Sea is not a legal issue. It's a, it's a leadership issue. During the first and uh, second Bush administration, uh, the number of freedom of navigation operations uh, plummeted because the United States was wholly focused on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that was a choice made by the leadership. There was nothing to do with international law or even a policy change that was announced. In my view, and I was, I was the Ocean's Law and Policy Advisor for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time, and I tried to change that. I was not successful. The number of FON operations went down to just a handful. And my view was, look, a superpower has got to be able to walk and chew gum. We got to be able to fight the war in Iraq, and we got we also have to maintain our rights to navigational freedom. Now, though they have come back in the second uh, Obama administration, and then uh, in a big way during the Trump administration. So this is the same way with cyber. We already have uh, our understanding of the law. Uh, in 2018, the Trump administration issued a new. U.S. Uh, policy that said that we're not just going to sit back and take it. We're going to be uh, proactive and we're going to impose consequences, meaningful consequences on countries that are hacking us as we read about every day, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran. And so I don't know what I don't know as far as you know, what goes on behind the behind the, the cipher lock, um, but I I hope that the United States uh, implements that policy in a very robust way to protect our government and our, um, our, our corporate sector and our private citizens and imposes consequences. We already have the legal basis and the policy framework for doing so, and now it would be just a leadership issue. Well, thank you, Dr. Kraska, for a terrific presentation. It was truly a an honor to host you this evening uh, to speak about a very interesting and relevant topic, and we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to spend it with us this evening. And we, we look forward to getting you back again soon, and, uh, and thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, Captain Lang and your team at the Foundation. Very much appreciate the invitation. You're welcome. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes uh, tonight's presentation. Thank you again for joining us, and uh, please join us on April 21st for a presentation by Dr. Tim Hoyt, who will speak to guests about great power competition. Uh, updates on this topic and others are posted on the Foundation's website at nwcfoundation.org, and be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Finally, tomorrow is April 1st, which coincides with 401 Gives, a statewide day of giving dedicated to deepening Rhode Island's culture of giving. Um, if you visit 401gives.org forward slash search, you can type in Naval War College Foundation and make a $25, $50, $100, $250, $250 greater donation to the Naval War College Foundation that will fund research and academic programs at the Naval War College that are administered by some of the nation's top faculty like Dr. Kraska. Please assist the foundation in its efforts to build a global network of educated leaders who are keenly interested in all matters affecting our national security. Have a great rest of your evening. Stay well, and thank you again.